live from Mohegan Sun Arena. I am speaking to maybe the best watch in all of women's college basketball, Maddie Segrist. Locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wale for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked on Women's Basketball. I'm delighted to be back in the same arena where we covered the WNBA Finals. We're going to be seeing some very interesting hoops here tomorrow, a great double header. Um, we're going to talk all about it with Maddie Segrist, who is here to entertain the fans, <laughs> as you hear the horn going off behind us. As a reminder, you can follow us at Locked on WBB. Subscribe six days a week. We have Women's basketball every Monday through Friday, every Saturday, the WNBA draft. We're here at his name quite a lot as we prepare for 2023. Uh, I am also obviously very proud of what we do at thenexthoops.com. Over 100 reported pieces every month. Make sure you subscribe. And so the place I want to start, Maddie, and we, you know, I told her the drill going in. She remembers. I come, I have various stat nerd related uh, issues uh, to run through that are what make her great. But I'm going to start with a list she's not on. The 2019 Hoop Girls Recruiting Ranking. Top 100. Think about that. <laughs> Considering all that you've done since, right? And so I'm curious two things. Number one, did you let that drive you? And number two, were they wrong or have you gotten better? What What do you think? Um, I definitely remember when it came out. Um, and, you know, I was a little disappointed that I wasn't on it, but um, I never really tried to look at that stuff, really let mm -hmm. it bother me. I know there's like a lot of lists, with a, still there's a lot of lists in college. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely use that stuff to drive, to drive, you know, yourself to continue to get better. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was just, you know, knowing that like, that doesn't mean I'm not a good player or anything mm -hmm. like that. Just, you know, using it as fuel to the fire and just try to be the best I can. You were recruited by, I know, a number of teams, Seton Hall. I assume after you put up 30 on Tony Bazzelli, you just don't apologize to him afterwards. <laughs> um, but also Marist. And so I want to talk about Poughkeepsie because it's obviously an important part of your identity. Your father, George, plays there, or played there. Was it hard not staying home? What was that, what was that conversation like and how was that for you? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely tough. Um, you know, growing up, I went to all the Marist games and all the camps and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, like as high school, you know, they had offered me in high school and, you know, so did a lot of other Mac schools, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, I, if I, I figured, you know, I should try to go, go somewhere else. Um, and, you know, hopefully it works out. Uh, but the Marist coaches, they were great. They were like... Sure. When I was, I remember I was so nervous to call Coach Georges and told, tell him like I wasn't coming. Mm -hmm. um, but they were great and they were so classy through the whole process, which I think made it, you know, easier for me. For sure, I'm yeah. sure. I mean, Brian George is a legend, of course. Yeah. Harry Pareto, a legend yeah. in and of himself. I, I mean, it's obviously now been a couple of years and Denise is doing a terrific job. But do you think about that? Do you think back to like those moments with Harry and like what were some of your biggest takeaways with him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was so fortunate to play under him for two years. Um, and one being my red shirt year, just being able to, you know, try to absorb as much as I could. And he really, um, he helped me like stay engaged on the sideline, like when I was sidelined um, mm -hmm. with my ankle and just like pointing out things and the motion, like what this kid was doing that was good and not good. And, uh, I just think seeing and having that, you know, mentorship for that year really helped me mm -hmm. see the game in a different way. And then uh, having him for my first year playing was great. Uh, you know, he, he always pushed you, but he believed in you too. Like, I, I remember specifically, like, we played somewhere and I was struggling from the 3-3 three, three, and he took the whole time out to tell me that I was going to make the next shot. And it was like, you know, like little things like that, um, you know, that he did. That, you know, I look back now and they were so important in like, you know, my confidence at the time. I mean, your confidence also had to be reinforced, I would think, by the fact that like your production was off the charts <laughs> from day one. 
Well, what's been fascinating to me, and I think people might miss it because you see the top line, you see the 20 and 10, and you assume, you know, all right, well, that's been a constant, is the smaller ways, but important ways that your game has gotten better. So I'm glad you brought up three-point range because that is a critical part. And I just want to show you, and this is a treat. Normally, we do these over StreamYard, and there's a recording, right? But I get to show you directly what I'm looking at when we are talking, okay? And you look at what you were doing here last year in 21-22. We go down to the shot chart, and very solid. And I think for the year, around 34% from three, something like that, um, you – skip ahead to what you did so far this year and it's lighting up bright red right you know whether that's 50 percent from the top of the key or the fact that you are all over the place dangerous from beyond the three-point line you are north of 40 percent now when we're talking in terms of the wnba and obviously the role that you're going to be looking to be playing there that's so critical take me through how this improvement has happened and uh you know what you when you kind of realized that this was where you got to um I mean, shoot, shooting like has always been like something I've enjoyed working on. Obviously, mm -hmm. sure, and it's always been like a constant. Like I'll go to the gym, hop on the shooting gun, and mm -hmm. you know, either different workouts you make a certain. Um, but this like off season, I've really worked on like shooting off the dribble, shooting you know contested because you can go and shoot a million shots with no one guarding you, right. and it's different. But you know, I don't usually have that luxury. Usually, someone's on me and are only open for a split second. Sure. So it's kind of just taking your time on three and realizing like, you have more time than you think. And mm -hmm. uh, you got to know the next one's going in. Like, and just having that mentality, like no matter what happens, you could be 0 for 8 from three, and just really thinking the next one's going to go in. How are you doing that? How are you working out and getting those contested shots? Where, where were you? Uh, what were you doing there? We have like, we actually, a couple of us shoot with Harry still. Oh, sure, um, sure. So like, you'll like mock guard each other, like, uh, you know, have somebody in your face when you're shooting mm -hmm. or like work off the dribble, just different moves that you could try to utilize and practice. And we played pickup a lot this summer. So just making sure like I was working on my other things to continue to expand the game mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, things I'm good at or that I like to do. Sure. You know, you want to be put in uncomfortable situations when you're working out so that you're ready for them in the game. So you got the opportunity to spend the summer in Philly then, in other words? Yeah, because we have summer sessions, so we're there anyway. So we're playing pickup a couple of days a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, which we we I think everyone on our team does a really good job, like, pushing each other during pickup, which is mm -hmm. important. And, you know, it's been carrying over this season. I don't mean to put you on the spot as a Philly person, but I'm just wondering if you have a – favorite cheese steak spot if there's mm. one that like is above the rest uh i mean i like gino's i know that yeah. <laughs> um but i haven't been to like that many like mm -hmm. i feel like we go to like the same typical few spots sure sure yeah. listen there's nothing wrong with gino's there's a reason why it's a classic <laughs> yeah. without a doubt so when we think about your comparisons right and it's a little bit hard to do because your your production as a freshman was not what we typically would see out of players. But mm -hmm. I pulled up the synergy numbers of a lottery pick in the 2018 draft, excuse me, in the 2019 draft, and that was Katie Lou Samuelson. And so just to show you in terms of synergy's points per possession, she was at 1.087 points per possession, super efficient, mm -hmm. um, you know, not far from here. Whereas in an elite eight, she scored 31 to beat Louisville, take them to the final four. Um, but you compare that to where you are, you are at 1.136. So you are ahead of that pace right now as a senior. Do you feel as if you have found another level of efficiency as a scorer? Uh, I think, you know, the biggest growth in my game in the last year has been like it's all in your mind. Hmm. And it's been, you know, knowing that you know what you're trying to accomplish out there like obviously you're trying to win the game that's the end goal so how sure. can you help your game uh, like your team and just being able to read the defense a little bit better because you've seen a lot more and then being patient i mean i know an area i really struggled my sophomore year was when the doubles would come right. i would try to just go through it or by the time i'm passing out you know i'm not getting a clean look to somebody else and mm -hmm. it's just now like you could either see it if it stays you pass it out if not you can work around it um, and just like having like a more calm, like knowing that there's been games that you start out great and there's games that you start out terrible and finish great. It's like almost you've, you've been in every situation. So sure. like you're, you're going to be all right no matter what. And mm -hmm. I think just that like calms me a lot. Like I've had games that I have three points. I've had games that I have 40. So it's just knowing that like 
it's all going to even out. It's just a balance. And as a point of personal privilege, I must tell you to our listeners, a lot more of the 40 than the 30. <laughs> so it is worth pointing that out, too. I, I want to talk about the what you're doing with double teams. Um, first, need to make sure that you guys hear from the NHTSA, our holiday season uh, in impaired driving. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That is correct. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. That means driving high could get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you're wrong. Everyone can tell. Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and change how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Because the bottom line is you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. Drive high, get a DUI, paid for by the NHTSA. So, good advice. So, when we talk about you through double teams, this is, I think, my favorite stat of yours. If you go to turnover percentage, right, it's up to 11.5, which is still pretty reasonable as a turnover percentage. But then, look what happens. You go to 7.7 junior year and 8.0 uh, so far here in your senior year. So that is just statistical demonstration of you talking about exactly what you did. What was that? Is it, I'm not even poor or nothing. How does that change uh, for you? I think just like expecting it. And like, I know I used to get like frustrated. I practiced when our coaches would be like, well, they're going to double in the put. I'd be like, you know, like you just get frustrated instead mm -hmm. of just, you know, seeing what I could do to counter that. Mm -hmm. And now just like almost expecting the double and just like thinking most teams are going to double. So you either have to you take your window when you, right when you have it or you're going to have to counter through it and mm -hmm. or pass the ball out. Yeah. So just like knowing that you have options instead of like, oh, the double comes. Let me just try to get a foul because mm -hmm. that, you know, statistically that doesn't work that much. True, true. And and was that I mean. Finishing through contact is something in high school a little bit easier when yeah, the opponents all, are smaller. Yeah, you know? when you're yeah. foot tall. And right. I'm saying. Yeah. So, so that's part of the other transition that I think is so interesting here. Like we talked about at the top, this wasn't necessarily an expectation of the pro. So you've got this communications degree. You are going, uh, you're going to get this master's in education. If not for the WNBA, which based on what I talked to in the league, they're going to insist that you play professional ball, but you'd want to be an educator. Is that right? Um, yeah, I've, I've always had an interest in like teaching. Um, I think now that, you know, I'm getting more towards like the end of my career in college, mm -hmm. I definitely want to continue to play at the next level sure. and then, you know, see what opportunities like, you know, whether that's coaching, like, I think I want to stay around the game for a while. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, having an education degree is like super helpful. I love going to the schools now and I love volunteering last year. Um, but I think like trying to bring that into the sports world or like you can take everything you learned and apply it in sports too. So no doubt. Just it, trying to do that. Is that student teaching? Is that when you say you're going into the schools? Yeah. So uh, last year I just volunteered at one of the local grammar schools um, after the season. And then this year for my master's, I've had to observe and then I'll start student teaching in January. Yeah. So well, it, it's, it is fun, but it isn't about I, My wife did the same thing. Yeah. So, so I remember this well. Um, when you think about that future though and april coming around i mean you must know there's there's a lot of buzz there's a lot of teams that are coming to your practices who are seeing it you know is that something that you've internalized like you know this is really happening have you started to think about what your life is going to look like in april and beyond uh i mean a little bit you definitely have those conversations you know with your parents your sure. coaches people around you um but the best advice like people that i've got is like just take it one game at a time mm -hmm. and just try to enjoy um enjoy why I'm in it uh, now. And then, you know, like, I haven't really looked at any of the mock stuff or anything like that, mm -hmm. uh, just because everything changes. It's like trying to predict the NCAA tournament now. Fair It'll enough. It'll change a thousand times. So just trying to stay true to what I'm doing and just be the best player I can be. Those goals when it comes to this year, I mean, you guys have succeeded. You've won in the NCAA tournament. What will feel like success to you when you think about what – this season brings? Uh, I think just like continuing to, you know, raise the bar for yourself, your program, your teammates. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the end goal is to go back to the NCAA tournament mm -hmm. and, you know, try to win a few games there. Uh, but we've had such like the one game at a time mentality that I think like that's what makes this group so special is like we don't overlook anyone. And 
uh, I think that's important because when you overlook people look too far ahead, that's when you get beat uh, by like maybe someone you're not supposed to get beat by. Mm -hmm. The legacy of going over to, you know, to be that leader for your younger teammates, to be part of building it forward. Take me through sort of the way you approach it. And have there been kind of moments where you've thought about, you know, like I'm a senior, so this is, the, you know, my time is running short to being able to be directly able to affect them. Uh, a little bit. I think it's been like kind of a natural progression through my career. Um, you know, when Coach Dillon got here, she was really on me for like a leadership role. And like, that's not like, my, in my nature, like, I'm not super loud. I'm not like a yeller. Sure. Um, so I've like, you know, led by example, probably when I was an underclassman. And then, mm -hmm. you know, when, as I got to the junior, senior, then, you, you know, you, you got to be local, more vocal, like calling your teammates out, you know, keeping everyone accountable. But I think it's kind of been like a natural progression. So it doesn't really feel like I don't really look at it as leadership. I just try to be a good teammate and, you know, help the younger kids along. Have you thought about where you rank in terms of Villanova history? I mean, it's, you know, you're all over the leaderboard, obviously, <laughs> and at the top of it in, in a lot of areas. Uh, yeah, like some of it. I mean, they, like, you know, but just like, you know, I wanted to come to Villanova to be an impact player. I wanted to be the best I could be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I never would have expected, you know, this. I, um, so especially so early in my career, like I wouldn't sure. have thought that. Um, but it's really the people at Villanova that have made the biggest difference on me. And, like, you know, hopefully I've impacted them as much as they've impacted me. No question about it. To that end, right, that early on impact where you are scoring as quickly as you did, where you're putting up those numbers, what was, like, an early memory of that in your freshman year where you saying, oh, wow, this is even beyond what I could have hoped? Uh, I think when I started, we were 0-3, mm -hmm. and I started the fourth game. Uh, and we won, and I had a good game. It was our first win, and I remember I was like, wow, I never thought, like, I could start as a freshman or four score over 20. Like, I, I forget exactly. Uh, and just, like, kind of just taking it in, and then I remember my parents, like, talking to me, like, you know, like, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Don't think, like, you have to keep doing that. Like, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, and then just kind of realizing, like, halfway through your freshman year, like, maybe it's not a fluke. Like, you can sustain, like, you can play at this level. Like, you could sustain it. And, you know, just kind of taking it like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable to say that you can play at this level. <laughs> I think the, it's hard to argue it is a fluke. I want to talk a little bit about what the future is bringing for you and the way it fits with the larger landscape. Do need to make sure that first we are talking about BetterHelp. And BetterHelp, as you can see right here, BetterHelp is an opportunity, an online chance to be able to talk to a licensed therapist. Over 3 million people have used it through, through their online site. BetterHelp is, of course, a sponsor of this program. But we want you to understand that BetterHelp knows that it is not always so easy to be able to find the time to get the help that you need. And so it is online only. Go to BetterHelp.com and check out the way they're able to help you. If you go to BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA, it'll be 10% off your first visit. BetterHelp.com. So you talk about having those family conversations, right? Was there a moment at home? I mean, you're one of four. Am I remembering that right? Yeah. I mean, was there a moment at home where there's sort of everyone talked about the fact that, wow, you really have a pro future in this game, that that was sort of understood? Uh, I mean, I think with my parents, like I've talked like, you know, I've always like thought about playing overseas, stuff like that. Sure. Um, and, you know, my dad, like not having a little bit of a basketball background, we've been able, been able to have more conversations like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but with my siblings, like they don't, <laughs> they don't care. No. Uh, I mean, they're happy for me. They're, they're, they support me in everything sure. I do, but, you know. They give me just as so much heat for everything. So, you know, but it's the, just, like, fun because, like, they don't care about that. So it just keeps you in check. Like, it makes you, like, I'll go home next week. We'll probably won't talk about any of the games or anything, which right. is, like, you know, a nice balance. I'm sure of it. Although yeah. I'm sure they'll also be at that table in April in New York. Oh, yeah, comes, for sure. Which would be very exciting. <laughs> the, the other part of this, and just from, like, your long-term perspective, it gets to a point where you get drafted, you play in the league, a lot of times you're then on the way to playing overseas. 
being part of the U23 three on three team, did that give you a taste of kind of what that travel was like? And just take me through what, you know, what you feel like you took from that experience beyond the game. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a great experience to like, you know, play with a lot of high level players, like, you know, compete within like tryouts and stuff. Obviously it's a controlled setting, but like, so like I haven't tried out for a team in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, doing that again was cool. And then, you know, you're throwing kids you don't know. I mean, you know of them, but you never played with them. So just, you know, what can you bring? Like, how do you play with others well? And I like, there was a few takeaways I took from that. And then like, the travel, like, it was, it was cool. Like, I would never would saw those parts of the world mm -hmm. um, if it weren't for, like, you know, playing there. Like, definitely wouldn't probably have went to Romania. Sure. And it was a cool experience. And then just seeing, like, how close you become, like, buddies with, like, the kids you're playing with. Um, you know, it gave me, like, I was really hopeful after that, you know, for the next chapter and, like, excited. It makes is, you really excited. It also is a different speed of game. I've talked to so many three-on-three yeah, three people. Definitely. And it's especially notable. So I mean, fast. you guys are so significantly a half-court team. So yeah. I'm by the last stat I'm leaving you with on this show, which I find particularly interesting, is if you look on your synergy data, the transition plays are only 6% of the time, which is very low, but you are at 1.241 points per possession. In other words, you get out in transition and you are somehow even more dangerous. <laughs> is there a part of you that's going to be... <clears throat> excuse me, especially excited at the W where all the teams are playing fast, you get to kind of unleash the type of player that you are in transition now. Yeah, I mean, of course. I think you got to you gotta be, you know, try to be good at everything um, in the game of basketball. So, yeah, that's so funny. I've never seen that before. A lot of people try to be good at everything in the game of basketball. Matt Seavers is good at everything <laughs> in the game of basketball. So to our listeners, thank you for listening. Maddie, thank you for being part of this show today make sure now that you've made us your first list that your second listen is locked on sports which gives you the fundamentals of every important game and story that's going on from all of our locked on hosts locked on sports of course subscribe to locked on women's basketball six days a week make us your first listen every single day we will be back with you tomorrow as we are every day talking women's basketball until then I am Howard McDowell wishing you a wonderful day. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.